Leslie Mitchell inviting you to share recollections of the British Film Festival of 1946, organized by the Daily Mail in conjunction with the British film industry. From the stage of the Leicester Square Theatre, almost a score of Britain's greatest film artists recalling scenes from notable British pictures in which they appeared during the years of war. Now, I'm going to pick out some of the high spots of that show. Moments of emotion, moments of laughter, moments of sincerity, each a scene from a British film. First, let's recall the great documentary films of the war. Who will ever forget Desert Victory and William Alwyn's stirring march from that film? certainly a great film. And while we're on the subject of the army, let's pick a scene from the way ahead. It takes place in a railway carriage where we meet three recruits on the way to join the army. First of all, there's the ex-departmental store manager, played by Raymond Huntley, his ex-assistant, Hugh Burden, and finally the interloper, Stanley Holloway. All on their way to join the army, and not one of them very happy about it. Yes, I think so. Confidentially, I may say that I took the opportunity when I was seeing who requires the managing director to suggest that our Mr. Thurple is no longer pulling his weight. Yes, that should do a lot of good, sir. Well, anyway, I've taken the matter out of the firm's hands now and written direct to my uh, MP. Who's he? <laughs> I beg your pardon? Who's your MP? Sir Henry Chalmers Thompson. Ah, old liver lips. <laughs> <laughs> Spoke for two hours and a half on a Brompton sewage scheme, Bill. Couldn't hear his for snores. <laughs> you know, Sir Henry. I'm in the house. A member? No, I work there on the boilers. <laughs> They'll be sorry to let me go. All right in the summer, you wait till the winter. There'll be some questions. There'll be some questions asked all right in the house. Who let Ted Brewer go off to the army? There's no one can work them dampers like what I can. They'll freeze, you see. Uh, you called up, so are we. All the same, I don't think you should refer to Sir Henry in the way you do. No. Listen. There's only one good man ever got into Parliament. Who would that be? Pleading Guy Fawkes. <laughs> If the way ahead typified the army, probably high on the list of claims for the Air Force film of the war, is that sincere study of the airmen, not only of Britain, but America too, the way to the stars. Do you remember that scene in the little pub where the RAF types from Hapenny Field are gathered each evening after the day's ops? The proprietors of this pub is Toddy, played by Rosamund John, and in the sequence, David, a young flight lieutenant, Michael Redgrave, is helping with the washing up in her little kitchen. I think if I had to hear someone was killed, I'd rather hear it straight out than hear it first as missing. Yes. It is rather an ugly word, isn't it? I know a kind of poem called Missing. Do you? 
Less said, the better. The bill unpaid, the dead letter. No roses at the end of Smith, my friend. Last words don't matter, and there are none to flatter. Words will not fill the post of Smith, the ghost. For Smith, our brother, only son of loving mother, the ocean lifted, stirred, leaving no words. Some weeks later, David and Toddy are married, and they find brief happiness during the bombing and the constant fighting of the Battle of Britain. Then, one day, from a fighter sweep over France, David fails to return. Flying officer Peter Penrose, his closest friend, played by John Mills, has to go and break the news to Toddy. Well, I, um, I don't know what to say, I'm afraid. I've, um, I've brought a few things of his down, which I found up in our room. Nothing, uh, nothing very important. Just a few handkerchiefs and socks and things. Thought I'd better bring them down. Oh, and there was, um, there was this uh, piece of paper with his, his writing on it that I thought you might like. I can't see without my glasses. What is it? Uh, it's, um, it's a bit of a poem, I think. Will you read it for me? Well, sorry, I, um... Please. Do not despair, for Johnny head in air. He sleeps as sound as Johnny underground. Fetch out no shroud for Johnny in the cloud. And keep your tears for him in after years. Better by far for Johnny, the bright star, to keep your head and see his children fed. Thank you, Peter. Bye, Tarry. One of the greatest achievements of the cinema during six years of war was the way it helped us to laugh during the darkest days. Here for a brief moment is one of the greatest of film comedy personalities, the one and only George Fondy. I do blimey right about something at last When the lights of the village get cracking Down the road to victory One of the major successes of the war years was the romantic melodrama, The Man in Grey. In this scene, Hester, a hard and ambitious girl played by Margaret Lockwood, is nursing her friend, the sweet and gentle Clarissa, played by Phyllis Calvert. Lord Rowan, Clarissa's husband, has made Hester his mistress. She is sitting by her friend's bedside, and it's then that she first thinks of furthering her own ambitions by murdering Clarissa. Is that you, Hester? Yes, love. I'm going to sit with you. Oh, I'm so glad. My head is torture. I shan't die, shall I? No, of course not. You'll be better soon. Your hand's lovely and cold. You used to make snowballs at Bath. It was snowing the day you came. Shh! Hester! Oh, I thought you'd gone. Stay with me. I feel safe when you're here. Hold my hand. 
Oh, you're so good to me. I've always known that whatever happened, I could rely on you. Hush, dear. Go to sleep. Stay near me. It's getting so dark. Don't let them put out the light. Drugged by Hester, Clarissa falls asleep. Then Hester snatches back the bedclothes and, throwing open the windows, lets in the raging storm. Hester goes over to the fireplace. And as she sits there, she hears in her mind the voice of the friend she has killed. The only true friend she ever knew. You shall share all I have, then you can't be injured. You always said you'd never be a schoolmistress. Remember? Hester, stay with me. I feel safe when you're here. I've always known that whatever happened, I could rely on you. Stay near me, dear. Clarissa. Clarissa, come back. Come back. <laughs> A big moment in the first British Film Festival came when Eric Portman reappeared in a sequence from 49th Parallel. In this picture, as you may remember, he played the part of a Nazi U-boat captain who is escaping through Canada. He's arrived at a Hutterite settlement of refugee Germans, and he makes an impassioned speech to his fellow countrymen, whom he fondly believes to be fellow Nazis. I call you brothers, and proudly acknowledge you as such. You who form the little stronghold of our people here in Canada will share in the happiness and prosperity that is waiting for us all when the storm is over and the sun rises, that mighty sun which will give us all we need in life. I am talking of the greatest idea in history, the supremacy of the Nordic race, the German people, I am talking of the man whose name, I am certain, lives in all our hearts, whose name hangs on all our lips, whether we can shout it to the world or only whisper it in one another's ear. Germans! Brothers! I ask you to join with me in paying homage to our glorious Führer! And here's part of the reply spoken by Anton Walbrook as the leader of the Hutterites. You call us Germans. You call us brothers. Yes, most of us are German. Our names are German, our tongue is German. Our old handwritten books are in German script. But we are not your brothers. Our German is dead. However hard this may be for some of us older people, it is a blessing for our children. Our children grow up against new backgrounds, new horizons. And they are free. Free to grow up as children, free to run and to laugh without being forced into uniforms, without being forced to march up and down the street singing battle songs. You think we hate you, but we don't. It is against our faith to hate. We only hate the power of evil which is spreading over the world. You and your Hitlers are like the microbes of some filthy disease, longing to multiply themselves until they destroy everything healthy in the world. No. We are not 
your brother. Now for one last recollection, Robert Donat as the young Mr. Pitt, speaking in the House of Commons with Napoleon about to invade England, a critical moment in Britain's history. Gentlemen, it is not enough to say that Bonaparte is a madman and will pay the price of his madness and folly. We must take care that we do not pay it first. We are called to struggle for the destiny, not of this country alone, but of the civilized world. Once rouse the spirit of this country and give that spirit a just and powerful direction, and you'll see it catching from town to town, from village to village, until soon the whole kingdom will be aflame. Our truest exultation ought to be that we hold out to countries now bending under the iron yoke of tyranny, the prospects of what the exertions of a free people can effect for the benefit of Europe, for the benefit of the world at large, and for the honor of mankind, I say that the spirit of Bonaparte and the principles he cherishes must be extinguished. And that other principles shall prevail. No, I don't think we shall forget these fine British films of the war. They were recalled for us by the original artists with the symphony orchestra directed by Sidney Torch in these excerpts from the British Film Festival of 1946. 